Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine of the Captain's Collective, and you're listening to a new series of podcasts called Field Notes, where I team up with my amigo John Dunaway and share tips and insights and compare notes around relevant topics in the outdoor world. We will be releasing one of these episodes every few weeks, and our hope is that through the things that we've picked up from some of the amazing folks around us, and the things that we've picked up from our reading and own journeys, can be shared with you in a fun and helpful way. This podcast is brought to you by Skinny Water Culture, Turtle Box Audio, Costa Sunglasses, Florida Fishing Products, and Orvis Fly Fishing. And of course, our amazing friends over at Epic Western, the official cocktail of the show, whether in the field or on the water or just sitting around and chatting like this podcast, Epic Western makes a great tasting product that isn't filled with a bunch of sugar and junk, so make sure to also check them out. In our first episode of the series, we are discussing what I believe is one of the biggest questions that I often hear people wrestling with, which is how to hunt and fish more. John and I share some things that we think can help people have more time to do the things that they love while still not losing sight of the other important areas of our lives. The key, we believe, is really to figure out what you want and to be disciplined and intentional as you move towards that. If you want to share topics with us that you would love to see us cover in the future, or just want to shoot the bull and share some of your ideas, fill out the form at captainscollective.com under the Field Notes tab, and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. Please make sure to subscribe and share and help us build this thing up. We hope you enjoy. All right. Well, hey, John, thanks so much for hanging out with me. I'm excited about this new project, Field Notes, where the idea is that you and I can come together and discuss things that we're learning, thinking about lessons from guys that we've had a chance, guys and gals that we've had a chance to be around who have really inspired us, who have educated us, who have helped us think through things. And hopefully this podcast will just be an opportunity to talk about some of those important lessons and aspects of those people's lives and kind of come together and bring some of the stuff that we've got a chance to see and learn to the same place and have some fun conversation. So I'm really grateful for you carving out some time here in the outskirts of Houston and your beautiful home office here. And yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's going to be good, man. The first thing I want to talk about is this idea of how to hunt and fish more. And that's a common theme when you meet people, they're like, I wish I could fish more. I wish I could hunt more. I wish I could mountain bike more. They want to they want to go out and have these experiences and have this lifestyle and they struggle to figure out how it fits in with their daily life where they're at. And so my thought is, um, before we dive into like tips and tricks and things that we've seen people do well, how would you approach the conversation on helping somebody think through how much should they really hunt and fish? How much do they really want to pursue it? What's the big picture conversation there at the beginning? I think anything that you get into, you've got to figure out how to prioritize it Mm -hmm. for yourself. First and foremost, like what works in my lifestyle and my life is different than what may work for yours. You can't say, Oh, I want to do it four days a week or I want Mm -hmm. to do it, you know, five months out of the year. So you've got to figure how it fits into your lifestyle specifically prioritizing the value that it brings for you. Are you a better person? If you do that more, Mm. you never like, Hey, my tank is full. And when I come back, I'm a better human if I can get myself to like 90% of what I want to be, mm-hmm. well, then when I come home, I'm a better person than if I was running around at 70%, like not feeling fulfilled. And then I'm daydreaming about it. So doing those things, there's a lot of components. Like does your family benefit from it? Do your friends benefit from it? Mm-hmm. Do you get to take them with it? And then it's not just a solo. So mm-hmm. that'd be my big thing. You just chopping it up and really looking at where it ranks in your life. Yeah. And yeah, what's the significance? Why is this thing so important to you? I was watching a documentary on basically the, this group of guys were trying to catch a hundred foot wave. And there was a guy that had a gnarly wipeout. He actually had like diagnosed PTSD from how bad his crash was. And he was in therapy and a question was posed of like, why does surfing matter so much to you? And it was when he figured that out, it's when he found that answer that he could get back on the board. And I think for some people in our world today, like they might be pursuing more hunting, pursuing more fishing, but they might not actually have even asked, what is it to me and why does it matter? And I think that's always the starting point because the answer might not actually be more. The answer might be maybe actually this isn't the thing that is going to fill your tank and isn't a place where you're going to find meeting or, or maybe it's not that you need to do it more, but maybe it's that, you know, 
you need to do it in a different way. And it's not always, it might be less about quantity or time spent and quality. And so I think that is an important part because just because you might be hunting, go from six days a year to 60 days a year, doesn't mean you're actually going to be happy and more fulfilled. And I think that's a great starting point. Yeah, for sure. Right. So I remember I was fishing with somebody down the coast who's an incredible angler. And at the time he had a boat for sale mm-hmm. and I'd taken my dad with me. He's like, John, you should probably buy this boat from him. And I turned to him and I pat him on the back. It's like, for what it would cost me to buy this boat, like I can come fish with you for like the next 10, 15 years. <laughs> and I'm going to get more out of that. Like for mm-hmm. me, I love fly fishing. I have got this draw back to the salt water that mm-hmm. I grew up as a kid doing, but honestly, I got burned out. My dad took us so much that I wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah. And so in that moment, for me personally, I've found that I love to tinker at stuff, right? Like I could love to do a lot of things, but I'm not an expert at it. I'm not going to be your fly fishing guru, mm-hmm. but I love doing it. And so for me, I find that, hey, I can go with a guide and what it costs me to go with that guide one time, Mm -hmm. the return, like ROI, I always say is so much higher than if I had a boat and was going out to chase it. And that's just for me, right? For other people, they want to be on the water. They want to learn the tides. They want to see where the fish are pushing and that's their whole jam. And Mm -hmm. that's awesome, right? We've all got our own niches, but if you don't want to do that, you have to weigh and figure out like, is it worth my time mm-hmm. to do all that? And I come home with a lot of scratches and kind of mediocre performances and you're frustrated. Like, like I remember we had a ski boat, right? And after college, uh, my wife and I still had it, but I was on the ship six months out of the year. So it left two, three month spiels mm-hmm. in the year. One of them was going to be in the winter and one of them was going to be in the summer. Mm-hmm. So, peak performance i had three months a year to use the boat people started getting jobs and hey you guys want to go because i was off for three straight months right yeah I'm like no i have a job like <laughs> you were that guy too yeah everybody has that friend yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> like i i can't go on a tuesday at mm-hmm. 10 o'clock in the morning right and then at the end of the year a couple of years into it i mean it's like every time i went to get it oh the battery's dead or a pump is bad or something dry rot. Right. Mm -hmm. And I tallied it up and I found that I was spending $500 every time I dumped that boat in the water. Like, Oh, it's nice to have your own boat. It's not free. Mm -hmm. And so in that scenario, I found that, yeah, I have this rad wakeboard boat, but it cost me more to use it every time. And I wasn't able to use it. Mm -hmm. And I was burning up my clock, fixing it, you know, trying to get people to go like, you know what? I, I've got guys that I know that do ride all the time and I can find those, those guys mm-hmm. like, Hey, I will cover the gas and I'll throw down, you know, whatever I need to. It cost me less to do it every time. And then I regained all this time back that I was yeah. spending. I'm not a killer mechanic. Mm-hmm. Right. And then I would be on YouTube trying to figure stuff out or like, you know, it's like, Hey, it's better to pay that mechanic to do it. That's expensive. But could I make money by doing something else that I'm better at? Or mm-hmm. could I just return my time? And that was a big one. When I learned that, I started applying that in the outdoors. Yeah. And I think all this is kind of tied to the sense that maybe where people need to start is actually running an assessment on their life and saying, okay, what do I really love? What does it take to do it? You know, what are my options to do it? What's really the big rocks of my life? If you're familiar with the illustration, if you had like a a mason jar and a bunch of rocks and sand, if you put the big rocks in and then you pour the sand over top of it, it'll kind of come around the big rocks and all of it will fit. But if you put the sand in first and you try to put the big things second, it won't all fit. And you can actually like try that at home if you're, (laughs) you know, a skeptic of, uh, of object relativity. But the, the purpose in life would be, hey, if if fishing for you is really important part of what you want to do and who you are and where you get joy and, and where you get recharged, then it's actually worth you being intentional and sitting down and thinking about what are the different ways I could do that and, and how do I 
uh, put that in my life, my budget first, my time first, like before, you know, I have 20 different subscription accounts to entertainment and I'm, you know, golfing and playing tennis and traveling and buying all these random things, like actually running an assessment and saying, if this is really meaningful to me, then I'm going to make time and make money for it. And that kind of leads me to the first kind of idea of, you know, I think what most people feel like the, the boundary for them to hunt and fish more is time. And we're going to talk about time, health, relationships, money, but I want to start with time because I think that's the one that's people's big boundary. How do you think about your time? You kind of alluded to that with the ski boat deal and how to maximize your time to be able to have these hunting and fishing and outdoor experiences. I think it's like we were talking about with the rocks, but I break it up a little more symmetrical. It's like, imagine your life is a block, like a block of Legos, you Mm -hmm. know, and you've got to stack all these pieces and you get, you've got 20 pieces. Well, which ones are important? And you start stacking up and realize, oh, well, I crushed uh, like two hours today on social media watching nonsense. I was laughing or mm-hmm. entertained, but did I really gain value from that when mm-hmm. I could have been out casting or I could have run down to the skeet range or maybe I could have cleared up my own gear in, in the barn. Mm-hmm. And so I look at it like that. Is there somebody, can I be better at this? And if I, and do I want to be, I think it's, that's the first one. Do I want to be better at this? Yeah. Or do I want to be competent, right? Like there's the gurus and then I think there's people that are competent and then you're people that are just going to go and do it to scratch an itch mm-hmm. and you can be, yeah. And I think that's a big one in the outdoors. Like, Oh, well, you're not a a class duck hunter, you know, or yeah, you don't grind in the public land and you're not always out there for some people. That's not what they want to do. And it doesn't mm-hmm. make them any less of a person, mm-hmm. but they found for them, Hey, I just want to go three times a year and I'm going to go to these outfitters that have everything dialed and they're going to get the best experience and they're going to go, they're going to do it. They're going to leave fulfilled. And they're going to have that memory. Mm-hmm. And somebody else like, no, my identity is running around 60 days out of the season, back country, chasing stuff, having a lot of strikeouts. But that leaves them more fulfilled. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, if you look back at your most meaningful outdoor moments and actually, like, get a pen and paper out and write down what about them. Is it the people? Is it the amount of ducks you shot? Is it the environment you were in? Is it the accommodations, the lack of stress, the ability to unplug? And I actually think just not being worried about oh, well, I, I have the bravado and I need to be seen as the guy. Well, then you're, you're actually not even into duck hunting. You're into, that's just being into you. And you could, it, ju- duck hunting happens to be the thing that you're trying to use to, you know, basically justify your existence in the world and give meaning. But yeah, I think like actually writing those things down and saying, how do I do more of that? How do I lean and leverage more into those things? And what I tell people at the time too, is you actually have a lot more time than you think. And I've used this illustration before where, I literally have a bunch of poker chips and so you have 168 hours a week. So, and then I color coordinate the poker chips to show them, but like, let's just say that you sleep eight hours a night. So that's 56. And then let's say that job wise, you're working 50 hours. I'll give some commute, whatever. Now, okay. plenty of people less, some people more. Okay. But the principle is the same. Now you're still left with, you know, basically almost you almost have, let's see, I got to do the math. You get 62, okay. 62 hours after eight hours sleep, 50 hours work. Now, of course you have family, you have relationships, you have, um, other things that are significant and important to you, but that's every single week you have 62 after those two blocks are done, those two Lego blocks. And so now all of a sudden it's like almost giving yourself this understanding that I have agency, I have control over how I choose to use my time. And, you know, you can, you can actually begin to write out like a time budget and say, how am I using it? And, you know, it's okay. I'm not a social media hater. I'm not a a movie hater, a Netflix hater. I have things I enjoy. Those are actually for my wife and I, we both have young kids. Like at the end of a long day, sometimes watching a true crime or watching a TV series or whatever is really meaningful. And I don't feel bad about how I use that time at all. It's like a budget, right? right? But I think for some people too, it's like looking in the mirror and saying, I have more time than I give myself credit, but I'm on my phone three hours a day. I'm watching 
50 hours of TV a week or whatever crazy. I think the average American watches over five hours of television a day. And then they go, John, I wish I had more time to fish. And you go, well, you would have a lot more time if you didn't watch so much TV. And maybe that time is really meaningful in that season of life. But I do think that, you know, looking, if you think about a budget, like looking at what are the things that are draining my time and, and how do I make those things harder to do? So like, I don't have a TV at my house. So my wife and I, when we watch something, we watch it on a computer. It does. We still watch stuff, but it doesn't make it just as easy just to mindlessly spend the day watching, right? you know, HGTV or whatever. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> whatever stuff people watch. I think that's really important. And then, um, you know, I think that, yeah, I think being able to plan and prioritize and, um, you know, I know for you, you're a big planner. You're a much bigger planner than me. Talk about like when, you, you know, so I'm talking about kind of your time on a week level, but big picture on a calendar. How do you think about those bigger experiences and how do you prioritize those? I've got a pretty interesting schedule where I work two weeks and then I'm off for two weeks, mm -hmm. which is allowed. I mean, but even before that, I went to sea for 10 years and I was gone three to four at a time and then I'd be off three to four months at a time. Mm -hmm. So I've, it's always led me to work in blocks. I think the nature of working on a ship led me to working in blocks mm -hmm. and I've just transferred that to now. Like I know on a calendar what days I have and I have to look at that and go, Ooh, I'd love to go on this trip. Well, that's a six day trip. Well, I've only got 14 off. If I go for six, well, I'm only going to leave eight and really it's like a little wash on either. Yeah. End. For my kids and like, well, they're in school, these three and here and I have taken to prioritizing that and realizing mm -hmm. does this trip, I used to use this excuse all the time and my wife gets on my case. Yeah. I'd be like this is a trip of a lifetime. Yeah. This is, I, we, my, my wife jokes about the word. I stopped using it. Opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, you always have a opportunity, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I will say the same thing of, of along those lines of being like, Hey, seize the opportunities. Mm -hmm. Well, seizing it, and going on every single opportunity, totally different. Mm -hmm. Because you have to prioritize, is that opportunity really the ROI that I want? Like, if I go on that, is it going to be that meaningful? Or is it just kind of becoming noise where you feel you have to, it, it goes back to like the Netflix thing. Oh, but that show's on there. I want to watch all four of those shows. Do I really, or am I going to gain that much? Or could I have done something better with my time and maybe one of them really is vital to you you yeah. get a lot of enjoyment and it's a give and take all the time mm -hmm. and I think one more thing I'll add on the time thing before we kind of start to move into money and health and is this idea too that we kind of alluded at and we're going to talk more about this when we talk about kids and family but to intersect into what you're doing meaningful relationships that you have and so if you have young kids you know, and you want to fish a lot, well, your fishing is probably going to look different than if you were a single guy. But, you know, for me, what I do with my daughters right now, and especially my seven year old is I'm really excited. This just, I mean, she's really getting into it she really loves it. Yeah, yeah, but cool. what fishing looks like with her is I might maybe do an hour of some sort of throwing a soft plastic or, or plug or something. But I know that I'm going to spend the majority of my time throwing shrimp. And I can still, I'm still out there. I got the sun on me. I'm in this beautiful environment. I'm enjoying it. I'm getting to watch my daughter find love for herself of, of what things that I love. It's like her own path is being laid before her. And yeah, if me and you were fishing, would I'm not above throwing shrimp, but that's probably not what we're going to do. But I'm getting to fish and I'm getting really quality time with my daughter. And I think that's where sometimes... You can think about maybe I need to change the way that I do this a little bit so that I can bring with me the people I love that I want to give time to. And that's going to open up a lot of time on your schedule too. Because if the only time I ever fish is with grown adults throwing, throwing flies, then fishing is going to compete with my time with my kids. But if I open up the door, now I can bring them with me and I have more time to fish and I'm, I'm intersecting that with my kids. Yeah. Kim will still say it. She's like, if you were single and didn't have a family, you would be all over the creation. I, I would probably go on a surf trip in Indonesia or something, right? Like, yes, it goes back to, but I'm not single. So yeah. therefore I don't do those things. And 
I remember years ago when they were smaller, she's like, I can't wait till they get bigger. Mm -hmm. And you're taking them on weekends. Like that's the goal for me. Mm -hmm. And this year, the two of them went on seven duck hunts. Mm -hmm. Look, I was, I probably wouldn't have done three or four of them just because the way the timing was, or I might not have stayed all weekend at the club, but because they wanted to go, it made it so much easier. I'm like, Hey, I'm not forfeiting my time with them. Mm -hmm. We're now sharing it. And the big one I've told them is you guys don't have to come. Yeah. Like, don't feel that if you want to come, let's go. Yeah. I'm glad to load you up and we can stay all weekend there. If you want to do one day and maybe you want to have a play date with some of your buddies, we'll go home. Yeah. But because they share that, it gives her some time freedom where, you know, she's not having to watch them or something. It's like, Oh, John's off hunting again. And mm -hmm. I've got to watch these kids, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Um, instead I take that burden of responsibility and I gain this, this time with them. Mm -hmm. Like, seeing them develop, seeing their uh, personal skills with other people in settings maybe they hadn't have met, watching them get up early, watching them deal with the elements, like just watching that they can pick out ducks now and know she's like, oh, that's the girl. I'm like, that's mm -hmm. right. That's the hen. And hey, see the guys? They've got all the color. These are the drakes. Mm -hmm. And they can pick that out. It's like they're gaining something versus, oh, uh, I don't know. I want to go fish off the dock down here, but I don't want to take them. Right. It's like, yeah, here, watch. You guys want to watch something? You know, like they're going to come away with that and they're not going to tell me anything important from watching some cat on TV or whatever mm -hmm. that show they're up to. <laughs> <laughs> Every show is some cat on TV, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And that kind of like brings us into, I, I just want to spend a moment talking a little bit more about family, friends and, and relationships and, I think one of the, one of the things that you know just thinking about opportunities and making decisions you know is um the ability to say no and to people to friends to opportunities maybe it's hey john do you want to go surfing in costa rica and you do well the the question isn't do i want to do that right it's it's is that the right thing based off my priorities that i've decided things that are meaningful to me yeah. So the other day I saw this quote and it really stood out to me and it said, the reason that we struggle with simplicity is because we have to say no. And there's this idea that most people, they struggle at whether it's, I need the approval of other people. Like I don't want to let John down. I don't want to, you know, my neighbor asked me to do this thing. So I don't want to be like the guy who says no to them, but the hardest person sometimes to say no to is ourself. But if it really does matter, if it's really important to you, knowing what your big rocks are in your life, knowing what's really important in your life will allow you to say, man, it would be awesome to go co surf in Costa Rica, but I, I really do want to try to, to hunt or to fish more. And so I'm going to have to say no to that so that I can say yes to other people or to say yes to other opportunities. And that's like the word decide has that, that Latin scission, like to cut. And so when you oh, decide, you about. cut off, like saying yes to, more duck trips is saying no to more wintertime red fishing or, sure. you know, going to the golf course a bunch. And I think that that's a really important thing. And there's a book called essentialism that I read that has, I would buy the book, tell people to buy the book just for one chapter. It talks about how to say no and how to do it well. And so if you're like, Hey, I want to invite you to do this thing. Like, man, John, thanks so much for inviting me to do that that sounds really amazing and i would love to do that unfortunately i'm not going to be able to say yes to that this year i hope you guys have an awesome time but that way i can actually focus because i think if a lot of people were to you know how you balance your your budget like they right. look back at their time and look at the things like they're like dang wish i wouldn't have done that i wish i wouldn't have said yeah. this i wish i wouldn't have bought this boat and instead spent three thousand dollars a year fishing these guided experiences or on this trip so I think that's really important too, is learning how to say no to family and friends in the appropriate, the right settings so that you can be able to actually go and do these things and knowing when to pull them in. Yeah, that's huge. And having those boundaries set in place, I think too, with, with folks, like even when I came in last night to like record, you're like, I'm taking my family to the rodeo. So I'm like, cool, man, I'm gonna go grab some food with some friends. Like some people would have felt pressure to be like, oh, I need to. Oh, I got to cancel this thing or 
I got it. It's like, no, it's okay to tell people this is kind of where my boundaries are. This is what's okay and not okay. And I think some, some folks are really going to have to work on that if they want to be able to, to do this more. Yeah. And that's dynamic, right? Life is totally dynamic. And I think that people will read books, um, in the movie 180 South, Yvonne Kennard makes a point. He says, people ask me all the time, what books should I read? What movies should I watch? He says, those are all great, but they're no substitute for going out and doing the real thing. Mm. And that is it, right? It's like realizing what things do you want to go do or which things do you want to like conceptualize? Mm. Like I can read about all of these ideas, how I could be a better angler or hunter. But sometimes there's no like substitution for actually going out and doing that real thing. Mm -hmm. And that has to be prioritized of, Hey, am I going to go out and do it today? Can I fit all five of these things in there? Like probably not. Mm -hmm. Like, do you want to do, maybe you're not going to be the guru, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go out there and try to do five things today and do them all mediocre, well, was your time really worth it? Or did mm -hmm. you, you gain your ROI was so little on each component that you could have done two of them really well instead of, and I just kind of touched on all these things mm -hmm. and then you might not realize it, but you had this big burden of stress on yourself. Like, oh, oh, Hey man, we got like five more minutes and uh, yep. I got to take off this other thing. Look, and it's not always static. I have been way better at periods of my life of blocking, prioritizing, mm -hmm. and then I'll kind of go aloof and just be like a wild man again, running around, just getting that adrenaline or like dopamine fix, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, and I have that book you were talking about, and I was yeah. reading it, and I had like seven pages on paper. It broke down all these different components of my life. I used to read art of manliness religiously. Mm -hmm. And there's a little black journal over there on my desk mm -hmm. and it has a thing he would do every year called the blueprint to life. Mm. So you would, you would write down these like 10 or 15 things and you would literally prioritize them. Well, I can go back and look at like four years in a row that the numbers didn't stay the same. What I liked four years ago, two years later, like that priority isn't as high. Mm -hmm. And I think you got to take stock in yourself mm -hmm. at least once a year. Like maybe it's not a new year's resolution. Maybe it's, Hey, the resolution is your life. Like stop, give yourself a moment. No different than your garage, right? Like, Oh, well my workbench was super clean, but then in the middle of hunting season, maybe I got, and eh, I don't want to mess with it right now. Just put all this in this corner and this here. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you go back in and you're like, how did this become a mess? Well, you didn't pull the jingle block and everything didn't fall down. Yeah. It was being added one piece at a time. Mm. So in all of these, Hey, prioritizing yourself to reflect on it and then restructure it. Hey, what I liked six months ago isn't like I did stuff for six months I go, man, that hunting trip wasn't really worth it. Or that fishing trip wasn't worth it. I could have gone to dinner with this person or I could have gone to lunch with that person because spending some time with them might have been great. And then you pull it all back in, look at it and go, all right, hey, you know what? In the next six months, I'm going to remember that. You don't have to say yes to all of them. Mm -hmm. And just because you said yes before doesn't mean that saying yes down the road is going to be the right play. Mm. So take stock in yourself, readdress things at least once a year mm -hmm. and see where do I need to put these priorities in my own life for now? Mm -hmm. Maybe you had no kids. Maybe you've got one kid or two or multiple or whatever it may be. Maybe you live close to the coast and then you move away. So going fishing every day was super easy. Yeah. But when you move away, Hey, it may be just as important, but guess what? I got to travel two hours to get there. That's not worth it to do it four days out of the week. Maybe yep. I just make two really banger days. And then I really watch the weather and I change my plans pertaining to that life's dynamic. And I think mm -hmm. that that's a big one. Everybody wants tips and tricks and here's the blueprint to how you should live. 
well, works for me doesn't work for you. Yeah, Hunter. you got to build your own. That's it. And, you know, a, a quick thing I'll say on that is I, I think that there's a lot of tools out there that could help people who want to hunt and fish more that don't get lifted up in the outdoor community very much. One of the ones I started using is called the Monk Journal. And when you hear Monk Journal, don't think like Monk. It's <laughs> I don't know if it's the best name. But what it does is every single day, and I actually do it on paper, even though I keep my calendar in my phone, I keep my calendar in three places okay. and my time is my most valuable asset. So I don't mind keeping tabs on it. So I have my calendar that's on my phone, computer, like certain people can access that and see like what's going on. I have my time in a Google drive sheet as like big block stuff about like big trips and things like that so that I can see where my openings are and try to learn from kind of my mistakes, things like that about making sure I have enough margin. And then third, I actually, just take every day and it has month, week and day. And I actually like journal through like what that day is going to look like, like what that time is going to look like. And it has a couple of things I think are really good there. It has gratitude exercises, which actually helps you just have a better headspace when you're doing these things, which we'll talk more about with uh, travel versus local hunting and fishing and kind of setting up those trips. But yeah. I think why a lot of people like trips is because they unplug and they're more present in it. And there's actually ways that you can do that locally but I think that's one of the things they like. So it like causes you to have a better headspace. It causes you, the thing that I love the most is at the end reflection, you do one in the morning, one at night, it doesn't take long, is you have to ask this question, what change am I gonna make tomorrow? Ooh, I like that. And I, that is actually really hard to sometimes go, I blew it today. <laughs> and tomorrow I'm gonna give myself more margin. Tomorrow I'm gonna better communicate with my wife about what I'm doing. Tomorrow I'm going to, but like when you can, cause yourself to sit down and really assess, man, I, I shouldn't have gone on that trip. Yeah. I was wrong. And here's how I'm going to do better in six months. Then you do that over the course of 20 years. And now that's, that's how these older guys that were around did it is they were being honest with themselves about what they like, what they don't like, what works, what mistakes. And, um, I think that's an important lesson. Let's talk a little bit about money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to do one thing on what we were just talking about. Yeah, go ahead. You know, uh, Kim and I were just talking about it yesterday, actually. Like, man, I have I have lost some structure in my life. Mm -hmm. it, like we're talking about the end of the season and oh, stopping and going, hey. Like when I was on the ship, I think of how structured I was. Mm -hmm. But he had all this free time. I was like, what did I do? I think it was Mark and Angel Hack Life was this website may still be around and I used to read it all the time, but, and they had an article, I'm pretty sure it was them. And it talked about, you know, you only have so much brain space mm -hmm. and building routines takes that brain space. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to wake up and go, what am I going to do? I've heard it called cognitive load. Like okay. if every day you just wore a black t-shirt, like you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't waste energy yes. deciding what shirt to wear. Yeah. Cognitive load. Yeah. I've heard that. Okay. Then that's exactly what it was. Yeah. Right. And so I'd have certain structures in my day. And the big one was, Hey, every evening I use this app called to do mm -hmm. and everything was digitized. I mean, from house maintenance, when do the water filters need to be changed? When do the air filters need to be changed? When am I fertilizing this grass? When am I taking out the trash? Whatever. And I put all these things in there just for like that component. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I had photo projects and everything would be in there. Well, I didn't have to remember like, Ooh, am I supposed to change the filter in November or whatever? Mm -hmm. I would get this reminder. So those things were out of my mind. I was no longer wasting that thought. I'm like, uh, when is that coming up? Let yeah. me, let me go check. Right. And I gotta go up in the attic and look, blah, blah, blah. Well, when I used that app every evening, I had a running to do. And I could just pile anything. Oh, I want to move this picture in my office. Mm -hmm. oh, I want to change this. It could be the smallest thing or the largest thing. And every evening I would sit down when everything was calm and I would structure what I want to do tomorrow. I'd lay out like kind of the week and I would move things around and give it a date, but then I could slide it. You know what? I want to do those three things tomorrow because for example, I've got it on paper right now. It's like, Hey, I got to burn this huge pile of brush and then I'm going to split a bunch of wood and add a new roof rack on my wood rack out back for, cause it's about to be summer. I'm going to grill a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I looked at the weather and I was like, Oh, Saturday we have a cool front and that wind's supposed to howl. Like 
lighting a giant pile of brush on fire. <laughs> yeah. It was a, it was a bad play. Mm -hmm. So Saturday, I'm not going to do that. I, I bumped it Sunday and reprioritized. But what I found was when I sat down every evening and planned what I was going to do the next day, then I woke up, my mind was fresh. I went to bed, not with these longing ideas of what am I going to do tomorrow? And what do I want to do? Blah, blah, blah. And I would wake up and be like, Hey, these are the things that I have to do. I told myself I'm going to do them. Mm -hmm. Bang, 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 bang. And that, like you're talking about that cognitive yeah. space. What'd you call it? Yeah. Cognitive, cognitive load. Cognitive is, load. Yeah. You can only, your, it's, your brain's like a computer. You have like 20 different windows running. It's going to, you're going to make bad decisions. You're going to take longer, right. To do those projects. And then the other thing is we're, we're not going to dive too deep into this on this one. We'll save it for future, but on being present in the thing that you have, it's like, we've all been there where like, you're like, Hunter, come duck hunt with me. So I'm in the blind and I'm sitting there and somebody's and I'm going, did I, did, did I pay this bill? Did I, did, did I like, and it's pulling away from it. But then the other thing is you got to learn too, if you want to do this, when you have that day that you need to get stuff done, you need to figure out how you're going to get it done or how you're going to outsource it, how you're going to automate it. Maybe you're just not going to have the best yard in the world. Like you're not a yard guy, you know, whatever. I, th I think that's a, I think that's a really important tip for people that, you know, part of how you hunt more and fish more is by doing better with your day to day and being more organized so that you can actually do it. No doubt. Yeah. Right. Get that cognitive load, find a structure that works for you where you can consolidate it. You know, like I keep, a little moleskin that also sitting over there. And I love because it can, it used to go in my back pocket. And I carried a little one, a leather mm -hmm. little sleeve and got tired of that. And went to a larger one. I could carry it in my work bag or go wherever. Um, cause I love stuff on paper. But then I found I was like keeping it in two places and I wasn't transferring it to the digital, which goes back to, Hey, I like pen and paper. Like that's my jam. I can free float. Mm -hmm. Digital's amazing. It just doesn't have the same for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Put it all on there. And then the end of the evening, I'd sit down either in a chair or my office, wherever it may be and go, let me input this into my phone. Cause I, sadly, I know I'm going to have that everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. It's my planner, right? It's my communication. It's my, my camera on a pinch, but stop consolidate and no longer the next morning. Be like, I know I have some stuff to do, but I forgot. Mm -hmm. Where did I write that down? I'm like, or you open it and you're like, mm. Oh, I really wanted to do that. And I put this down there, but I didn't add it and consolidated it. Yeah. So if or you, you have that one little task where you're like, Hey John, let's go fish tomorrow. It looks amazing. Oh, dude, I'm really sorry. I have to do this one thing that's going to take, but I can't go do this whole day because I didn't get my stuff done. And now I'm in the bind and I got to do it. And you know, you, or on a time level, if you let something go bad, you don't maintenance it then it's going to take more time in the back end. So what could have took, took you an hour because you kept putting it off is now going to be a two day project because you kept kicking that can. Yeah. On the ship, we had these giant schedules for, we call it PM, right? Pre preventative maintenance. Mm -hmm. so like, how do you, how do you work on a ship that's 600 feet long? We only have 14 people and really only like four of them are working on deck. Like I read this awesome book one time called knife fights. It was by a Lieutenant Colonel in the army. I'll spare you all the details, but the biggest thing I took away from it is he had a section called PTFC. Give purpose, trust, focus, and camaraderie. And when I first got it, I was like, what do I need to read a book about the army? This guy's like a working in a tank battalion. Yeah, yeah. He, because the reality is that life is the same for everybody. You have structure, you have things you got to do. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. A team could be your family. It could be your work colleagues. You could be in an office setting or you could be on a battlefield, but the dangers vary, but the structures are truly all the same. Mm -hmm. It's like, so working on a ship is no different than working in an office, right? I, I had a team. So for that, you found, Hey, you had to give everybody purpose and you can do this for yourself. And I use it. Give myself purpose. My purpose is to be, a better duck hunter. Mm -hmm. Well, in that, in my group of friends, I need people that they trust me. It's no longer like, because if they trust me, 
they're willing to go out of their way to do more things. Mm -hmm. And I will be same thing. If they trust me, it's because I'm building trust in myself and therefore I hope I'm doing the same for them. Mm -hmm. So you have trust. You'll, you can work together better. It's like, Hey, he's here for me. Mm -hmm. Give themselves focus. I want to be a better duck hunter. (laughs) That is a massive, massive idea. What part of duck hunting? Mm -hmm. Well, I want to be a better duck hunter on the Texas coast because what's better for me here is totally different than the guys and girls that are in Arkansas timber, which is different than people hunting on the East coast in big water. Right? So now I have focus, Mm -hmm. focus on your niche. Well, that is also can be broken down even further. Oh, I just want to be a better duck hunter on the Texas coast. Mm -hmm. What part of it? You want to be a better caller? Do you want to be better in choosing your spot? Like, okay, start learning. Why should I hunt this point? Why should I be in the marsh versus being out on the coastline? Mm -hmm. And so you take it down into digestible blocks. It's like giving a kid a giant plate and be like, you have to eat all that. They're like, oh, they refute it. And you're like, you need to eat two pieces of that broccoli. And then you need, you know, some of the steak or whatever it is. If you take their focus into something, just keep getting it smaller. Mm. Boom. That's digestible. You have to eat that cow. I'm like, oh, well, it's in the freezer, right? It's like, yeah, you just need to eat a pack of ground beef every day. And then camaraderie. If you have camaraderie because they have purpose, they get what they need to do. They have trust in you mm-hmm. that you're there for them. And they have focus that, you know what? This is a digestible task, whatever it may be. And you have camaraderie. You don't just trust that person. Like, I have a longing that these people believe in me. Yeah. That they are going to be. He told me that if I need his help, he will come out here and do it for me. Well, now the camaraderie is that, hey, he will be here because he told me and I trust him. But he shows up. And because he shows up, I need to be there for that person. Hmm. And now you've got this giant team or your family or whatever it is. So if you can take those four components off your really good. go yeah. to races. No, that's super helpful. All right. Let's talk about on the money side. It's similar because we actually been talking a lot about time as if it were money as in like budgeting it and give assigning it, you know, um, giving every, every dollar a name, giving every, you know, kind of allocating it that way. But when you start talking about money, um, you know, I think there's this misconception that to do it a lot, it has to be expensive and there are expenses, but expensive is also a relative term. And so I think when you understand if it, what it means to you, then you can understand how much you should give to it because, um, it might be expensive compared to like, if you were doing disc golf all the time, or it might be expensive if you were really into hiking, but expensive is a little bit of a subjective term, you know, as far as comparative to, how much money you put on other things or how much money, you know, how much you invest in it might look different than me based on income, based on a lot of other factors. But there's a, there's a book, um, called rich life and, um, my rich life. And it, it's kind of like a book about understanding what things are meaningful and and matter to you and how to use your money to do those things. And I think it's, I think it's a really helpful book, but he has this idea and he calls it the hundred dollar exercise. And what he does is you, you, you simplify just for purposes of your perspective. Imagine if, um, your, the amount of money you made was just like a hundred dollars a month. Like you just to do it percentage wise. And then you were writing out like the things of, you know, how, how much money are you okay going to your house? So you might say, well, out of a hundred, I'm okay with $20 out of a hundred going in the house. That feels right to me. Okay, great. Uh, I'm okay with, uh, $5 going to vehicles and, you do that and then you say, okay, well, would you be okay if you're telling me the most important thing, you know, activity that you do that you enjoy, that you love is actually hunting, then maybe 15 or $20 going to your hunting is okay. Um, now that means that money's not going to go to something else. But if you do that exercise, I think it's really cool because it will free you from like, you know, it feels expensive if you're looking at it on the back end of like, wow, I spent, you know, $1,500 this month, um, on hunting and fishing. But 
if you do that exercise, I think that opens up a lot. And then it helps you understand what things am I not going to spend money on, which are actually just as important. So for me personally, I spend on a personal level, and this isn't just because I work with skinny water culture and stuff. I spend less than $300 a year on clothes for me. I'm not a clothes guy, but Hey, you might really love clothes. You might love the artistic expression, the functionality. I haven't bought a suit. Like I, I have one suit that fits. It's a black suit. Anytime I have to wear a suit, I wear it. It doesn't even fit that well. I don't care because, because <laughs> what matters to me isn't being the best dressed guy at the wedding. I would. And so I can't spend $1,500 on a suit every year. And that's $1,500 out of fishing. So I'm okay being the guy in a baggy suit if that means that I get to do the things that I love. And I think that's an important exercise for people to do too is, you know, are you actually happy with the amount of money you're spending? And then of course there's ways that you can save money. You know, it might be the type of trips you go on, but how do you think through, like how would you try to help somebody think through like the financial part of hunting and fishing more? Man, I would say that you have to be brutally honest with yourself, mm -hmm. whether it's a spreadsheet or pen and paper, just like your time and the Lego blocks we talked about, well, you only have so much of it. And maybe right now you, you've got a hundred, like we'll just use round numbers mm -hmm. to spend. And you decide, I really want to go on, on this trip. And it costs, you know, it costs 40. Like, uh, but I don't, but I only have 20 to give up. You got to take the blocks from other places to do it. Or you go, you know what, instead of going fishing, three days we're going duck hunting three days i'm gonna go work extra or i'm gonna find it if you are fortunate enough to have an avenue that can generate some more income mm -hmm. you go you know what i'm not gonna take these three days to myself i'm going to do those generate some more revenue because i really really want to go on this trip mm -hmm. and then offset it it's it's like back to the time balance if it's important to you you've got to just move those sliders around, make the math add up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it doesn't. Then maybe you need to decide, you know what? It's not this year, but I can roll that to next year. So in order to roll it to next year, I need to shave 10 this year and 10 next year instead of 20 all this year. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd say to people is. Yeah. I like the extra. So one of the guys that I look up to doesn't even have social media. Amazing, amazing turkey hunter, amazing deer hunter. And he has like a small t-shirt business where he has set it up to where like people can order t-shirts through him. And the only reason he has that business is so that he can take the money from that and hunt more. So it's, he doesn't have a passion for t-shirts, but he does it <laughs> so that he can have his passion for hunting. Another idea I would give people is let's just say that I lived in Texas and like I, I couldn't afford to be a part of the duck hunting club and all that. But I wanted to like be out there and experience that. And I love being out there and experience it. I would come to you and say, Hey John, um, man, I, I love just like being out in the blind and learning and doing this stuff. I'm not going to hunt, but could I like, could I help around the blind? Maybe I can, maybe I can shoot some, some videos on my phone for you guys, or maybe I could pick up a camera and, and learn how to do that. And then I'm not going to, you know, these guys have paid to be the ones shooting the birds, but there, you can be creative. And I did that cause I got into quail hunting and I got a bird dog and I realized I can't like afford to quail hunt all the time, but I had certain situations where I was like, Hey, really what matters to me is just working my dog. I, you, how about you hunt and I'll, I'll work my dog. And I, to me in that particular circumstance, I have just as much fun being the guy without the gun, but it's zero cost. Yeah. I mean, I started doing that with my camera and photography. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really love photography in this creative outlet. Mm hmm but I can remember I was doing public land stuff and I was not a member of the club and I couldn't afford to be in the club at the time. And they would invite me and I get to come out a handful of times. I remember one time I asked, it's like, Hey, I saved some money. But like, can I just go over there? It's like, no, you're not a member. You can't just come unless we invited you. Yeah. But I was there all the time. And the, the owner saw this and he actually kind of opened that door to me. It's like, I started instead of paying to get birds cleaned, I was like, Eh, I don't want to, you know, spend whatever it was at the time to get these birds cleaned. Like if I hunted four times in the month, I could have kept that money for myself and either gas or coming back to the club for an extra hunt, started cleaning my own birds. It's like little things that I could take out. And then they started letting me just help. 
And then I would hang around. I was like, hey, I'll go clean out the blinds with you and you know, be a grunt. But I, I had to add a value to them, right? Yeah. It wasn't coming begging like, hey, I don't want to pay. I'm like, well, we run a business and that doesn't really help us. But <laughs> it's like, it's a two-way street, right? Yeah. Did you add value to them? And I would say the same thing with a friendship, right? Like, do you add value to them? Or is this a mutual thing, right? Because mm-hmm. you're, you're both benefiting. You're both growing. And that's the whole goal. Because otherwise, I feel like you're just leeching off something. Yeah. And I totally did that. I, st- I, I stayed out there 30 days one season in different pre-kids and all that. I was living out there. I, was, I would hunt with the guys. Then I'd help them clean birds. And then I'd help work on rangers or decoys or go fix up blinds or run around and scout or whatever it may be. And I gained a ton of knowledge. Mm-hmm. I got more time back because I didn't financially have the ability to do it. And like you're saying with the dog, you know, I started bringing my camera. We can kind of hit two things in this, like the multitasking, right? Well, you're bringing yeah. the process so much. I can't actually like photograph my full potential and duck kind of my full potential in the same time frame. Sure. It doesn't happen. I used to try it. Yeah. You're like, uh, I kind of shot sloppy on that volley and then tried to grab my camera really quick and the photos turned out like crap and yeah, it wasn't worth it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Found, definitely. Okay. I'm going to shoot my gun while it's really early while the light's not that good anyways. And the birds are working the best. And then I'm going to find a period where I'm just going to shoot my camera, which led to my photography, you know, growing. I got mm-hmm. better at seeing things and I edited more, blah, blah, blah. I was able to turn it into a little side hustle that does it offsets my hunting expense Mm -hmm. to where, Hey, you know what I'm choosing on a three day hunt that I'm going to give up a couple hours each day to shoot photographs and people have found value in it. And I'm really lucky to get to do it. Like, Mm -hmm. Hey, I can then license those images to these brands that use it to grow their own company. It's, it's mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. They don't have to hire me for full day rates. They don't have to send their own crews and travel and do all that. I'm like, Hey, I'm already going on this trip. If your budget is whatever it may be, it's like, let's just say 5,000 bucks is a media budget. They might have it's like, Oh, well if they went on that trip, they'd have to fly probably two people and they'd have to pay the guides, right? The rate to go. Mm-hmm. Well then at the end of it, they're like, well, we have like $700 left for photo stuff. we be like, Hey, if you guys are going to spend that, Maybe I just want 2,500 of it. You guys pocketed 2,500 bucks, 2,500 offset some of my hunting. And they still got all these images, which they are going to take back for their company to hopefully grow. Right. Some more stuff. It's two way street. Mm -hmm. It's a financial component. It's a time component. That's beneficial. I've found for some of them, for them. And it's beneficial for me. I'm like, I can totally give up a little time while I'm out there to do this. Maybe photography for you. It may be a helping hand. You know, maybe you've got a skill set that, hey, they want to start their own podcast. Well, you guys want to figure out which yeah. lighting to buy, which is a whole other topic, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, how to frame it, how to get it edited, blah blah blah. Like, you're that asset that benefits them, and it affords you time to come in there. It's not going to work everywhere you go, yeah. and don't just. Don't be afraid of them saying no. That's mm-hmm. another thing. That's a big one. But it doesn't hurt to ask. And you don't have to just do media. Like if I was trying to like get into sport fishing, which I would not be able to afford, my first angle would be trying to find guys to say, man, like on certain situations, can I deck can? Can I wash the boat? Can I, can I add value? Is there a way like just expressing, hey, I really want to do this. I don't, I don't really have enough money to do it the normal way. Is there a way that I can do this with you where it's mutually beneficial and people are afraid to ask, but if you ask, you'd be amazed how many people can find ways to do that. And, um, I think that's a huge way to try to do what you love more is trying to get creative about, you know, back to the blueprint. You can't just carbon copy someone else. You have to get outside of the box and figure out what works for you. For sure. Right. And like you're talking about the deck handing, Guys bring their boat in, they're tired, they've been up early, they've been setting up rigs, they've been dealing with clients or whatever it may be. The last thing they probably want to do is have to stay another hour or two washing the boat. I'm like, We could pay somebody to come do it. Well, that's a financial component. They have to decide, is that worth it or not? Is it more valuable than their time? 
or they go, you know what? We can afford to keep one other guy on the boat tomorrow or next week. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'll trade you because for them, they're like, Hey, we got two hours back today. I can either go take a nap or they could work on setting up the gear for tomorrow that then they don't have to mess with the next day and didn't become a financial component. They found slack in their own system. Like, Hey, we've got this space in the blind. You can come hang. Mm -hmm. And Hey, I didn't have to clean birds for another like 30 minutes. This guy took care of it. Mm -hmm. Like it not being, it's like, don't be scared to ask, but weigh it for yourself and go, am I really adding value to this person mm -hmm. or am I just coming to benefit myself? Yeah. And if the answer is that it's just going to benefit you, then maybe think about it. Is that what you want to be known for? Yeah. Like, Oh, here's this leech. He's like, yeah. And we're going to talk about the yeah. building outdoor community and, and I think that'll come up, but just to kind of recap and wrap this one up and there's all sorts of fun avenues that we can go down in f previous episodes. Number one, start with what really matters and what is meaningful to you begin to intentionally build your life around it so that you're making it easy to do the things you love, which means the things that you don't love as much, maybe you should actually think about how do I make them harder for me to do? Then begin to think about relationships and how can you intersect people into it? How can you be more intentional and more present and, and more effective with the things that you do need to do from spending time with your kids to getting household stuff done? And then on the financial part, um, you know, budgeting around it, making it a priority, but also realizing that maybe if you really love it and you want to spend more money doing it, you might need to get a second job and that money's not the only payment. So maybe for you, it's having conversations about, I want to be a part of this duck club. I can't pay the full 10,000. I could pay 2000, but what could I, you know, maybe I can pay for lack of a better phrase in some other way. Maybe I can you know, be the first guy there an hour before everybody else getting XYZ set up. Maybe I can work on the off season at the duck ranch or duck club, you know, to be able to do that and really begin to, to go after it. And I think if you begin to do all these things that we talked about, and it's just a starting point, we could sit here for days yeah. until, until we pass out talking about it. I think there you're taking steps. And the last thing I'll add is just being realistic too with if you really want to do this, it's, it's, gonna, it's okay if it takes you years to get there. When we see these guys and girls who are 60 years old and they're doing it so well, they've spent years and years and years of their life getting there. So you got to be willing to take a little time saying, okay, my goal is in five years to be hunting every day of that season. How do I get there? And then reverse engineer and get there. But man, a lot of helpful stuff. Excited to dive into a little bit more, man. Yeah, for sure. Don't worry, you're not going to eat the whole cow today, right? Just take it bite by bite. Uh, be brutally honest with yourself. Give yourself a blueprint to life and revisit it from time to time. Because, again, it's dynamic. What worked today doesn't work next month. And if you can restructure that and constantly on the fly make those adoptions, like you can go with the best guys. You've got some of the best blinds, I think, on east side of Houston for, for duck and right? That blind doesn't always produce. Like, we should be able to hunt here every day and shoot a lemon. Why didn't it work though? Because variables change. And if you get so stuck in your ways that you're just going to do it over and over and over, life will probably pass you by. So be brutally honest. Uh, adapt on the fly. Make the most of it. And know that you don't have to, you're not going to get there today. You're not going to be the guru. So good. Well, thanks, man. Dive yeah. into more. Sounds good.